faith cometh by hearing the word of God. And God will always meet faith. And what is faith? Well, that's the question. What is faith? I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. I'm often troubled when I prayed for the sick. Just recently had that experience again. I met some saints. Not anybody that's here. I don't feel bad. I'm not pointing right at you, see? Somebody else. But saints. I was praying for the sick. And talking faith. And praying faith. And God was there. And these saints talked unbelief. You'd be surprised how much unbelief there's hanging on us. The Bible talks about the sin that does so easily beset us. It sticks to us. Die klebt uns an. Gerade wie die Kleten. Das ist Unglaube. It's unbelief. And you'd be surprised what, a, what mountains of unbelief there are in the saints. You don't find it out until the cat bites them or a dog barks at them or or something else happens and they, they really have to believe God why then their faith is gone absolutely gone what is faith? why faith is reckoning with God when Jesus Christ came down from heaven he came with a message and he came with an authority he had a job all the prophets had foretold that he would come and open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf should be unstopped. And the lame man should leap as in heart. And so when he came, what could you expect him to do but that? And the people that expected it of him got it. <laughs> and those that didn't expect it didn't get anything. He could there do no mighty miracles because of their unbelief. Right in his father's house or in his father's hometown. He couldn't because of their unbelief. The hands of Almighty God were tied because of their unbelief. And then some heathen would come along. Some Syrophoenician woman. And she said, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to hang on now. She got hold of him. And she just hung on. And he had to drag her along with every step. He, she just hung on. And can you see it? You got enough? sanctified imagination to see that woman just hanging on to his skirt and he trying to get away and she hanging on. Praise the Lord. Oh beloved, hang on. She hung on. Why he, the disciples came to him and they said, send her away. She is, uh, makes too much noise. She belongs to those holy rovers. So send her away. She's a fanatic. She's a sectarian. Send her home. And the Lord tried to, but he had a purpose in it. Oh, I tell you, there was a purpose in it. Because faith is the victory that smites the devil. And here were a lot of devils destroying men and women inside of Phoenicia. And here was a woman whom God Almighty was able to make a missionary to that nation. And he put her to the test. See if her faith is real. See if she'll still hang on. What made her hang on? Not her goodness. Not because she was worthy. Or she thought she had deserved anything at all. Oh, how we hang on when we think we've deserved something. You know who I am? You know me? Why the Lord ought to do this for me? But she hung on in spite of the fact that he likened her to dogs that eat the crumbs. Or that shouldn't have the bread that belongs to the children. She said, all right. You call me that if you tax me like that. But the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She still hung on for dear life. She wouldn't let him go. She knew what he came to do. She knew that. And she knew he helped everybody that came to him. And she was not going to go away unsatisfied. Isn't that what Jesus means when he says, Men are always to pray and not to give up? 
You don't have to give up. They should not faint. He says, Verily I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. And thereby the Lord Jesus signifies that there may be a fight connected with your victory that you need. But if you don't faint, if you prove to God that you believe him in spite of everything, he will avenge them speedily. Beloved, divine healing like every other blessing is only possible when God does it. God's got to heal you. Praise the Lord. God's got to do the job after all. <laughs> and so Jesus said to this woman, because of this word, go thy way. Did you ever find out how much words mean? Words. Oh, close that window. I can't stand that draft. I'll get a cold. All right, according to your faith, be it up to you. You'll have it. You open the door to the devil. I got such a kink in my back. I know what that is. My grandma had that. Why, that's uh, Ishias. <laughs> sure, and you'll certainly have it. Do you know what words will do? And do you know what grumbling will do? Why, when the Israelites murmured, snakes came out where their tears fell in the sand, fiery serpents came up. They opened the door to the devil. Jesus Christ said, because of this word, do you know what one word will do? Just one word. It will defeat the devil. They overcame Satan, the dragon, by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Glory to God. And if Jesus Christ came down from heaven to save sinners and to heal the sick and to open the eyes of the blind, he did it. Whenever there was faith, it was his job. He was faithful and just to fulfill the will of God when he asks you and me to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. He puts himself on record as saying, If you'll only make room, I will reign. Where the curse is found, I'll make my blessing to flow, and sin shall not have dominion over you. And you say, well, if Jesus was here, I certainly would believe him. Listen, he is here. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Not the man Christ Jesus who walked in the flesh upon earth, but glory to God. Why did God raise him from the dead? Oh, beloved, that he might have mercy upon the whole world. Not only Nazareth, not only Palestine, not only that, that land over there, but the whole world to make his promises accessible to the whole world. And today, all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us, Paul says. Beloved, what did God raise him from the dead for? If he sent him to Nazareth with the message of the gospel and said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, beloved, today much more than ever, because he's raised from the dead. No more to return unto corruption. But now he has opened heaven. Glory to God. And today all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. But who believes it? That's the question. Who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And so Paul says, the word of faith is this. That if thou shalt, it's in your mouth. Oh, when you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, all hell is smitten. The word of faith. It isn't just the word. But when in your heart you know and you believe that God raised him from the dead, why then the resurrected Son of God is on the throne and he manifests his mighty power. His right hand is stretched out to do his wonders as of old. Oh, what a message, beloved. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never 
Glory to his name. And just before I came to Brooklyn, the Lord said to me these words. He said, I'm going to surprise you. You said stakes. But I'm going to surprise you and I'm going to show what I can do. <laughs> and it started right from the beginning. And what wonderful things God has done. Wherever there was faith. Remember when Sister Cash called me. I didn't know her then. But little Eleanor was sick unto death. When I came into the house five years old. I saw her burning up with fever with pneumonia. And I got frightened because I had just seen two children die of that disease. I didn't want to see another one die. What was I going to do? While I was there, a doctor knocked at the door. Sister Cash met him at the door. Mr. Cash had sent him or called for him. She said, sorry, sir, but we have a doctor. That was the word of faith. We have a doctor. Do we? Didn't God say, I am the Lord, thy physician? Didn't God say that? Yeah. Oh, I tell you, and in order to make it true, he had to bear our infirmity and our pains and go into the belly of hell and destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and come forth triumphantly. And he went up with a shout, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers and he commanded them not to go forth with medicine chests but to go forth with this gospel which is the power of God unto salvation that means unto deliverance to everyone that believeth beloved we're not going to believe until we know what God has promised until we have settled it in our hearts that Jesus Christ is true glory to God Oh, and the Holy Spirit makes real to me this unspeakably wonderful truth. Glory to God. You know, I laugh at myself and I laugh at all of us. When people walk around with uh, aspirin tablets and stuff, I say, what, if, what do you expect is going to happen when you lie in the grave? Some people will lie in the grave. They're lying now. All men are lying. And then you expect God to raise you from the dead? You really expect that? You better take some aspirin tablets along with you, just in case. You expect God to do that miracle? Oh, beloved, Paul says, and he, we believe that he will raise up us by Jesus Christ and will present us with you. Oh, for that resurrection faith. Oh, to know him and the power of his resurrection. We have privileges, beloved, that we lose sight of unless we get acquainted with Jesus. Unless we discover who he is and what he is. Unless we believe his word. And so we've got to get acquainted with his word. That's where faith comes from. I remember when we prayed for little Eleanor. I went home and next day I made a beeline for their home because I wanted to know what had happened. I didn't get a call and found her everywhere at home. Wonderful. That was the beginning of something. Hasn't ended yet. The beginning of a real revival because God stretched forth his hand and raised up that little girl. That was really the beginning of the east side work. And so many times I was called down to South Brooklyn into a home where another little girl, beautiful little girl, was sick with pneumonia, also five years old, a little sweet. I knew the father. He used to come to meeting. And one night after the altar service around 11 o'clock, I saw him sitting back there and I went to ask him whether he wanted something. He said, y'all, good Swedish. He said, my little girl is sick unto death. And the doctor says she's going to die unless we take her to the hospital. So will you come and pray for her? I said, where do you live? He said, down in South Brooklyn. <laughs> but he said, I got my car here. So okay, I said, I'll come along. And was it a locomotive? It was one of these old time tin cans. 
as long as Leviathan and as slow as a, a turtle. Really, I watched the speedometer. It never reached 20 miles an hour. Didn't go that high. Maybe he had a monitor, I don't know. But his tongue went the faster. All the way down to South Brooklyn, we got there way after midnight. He was telling me how backslidden Pentecost was and how bad off people were and how it used to be 40 years ago and so on and so on. I'd heard that old tale long, many times. So we came into that home. It was way down in the south end of South Brooklyn and uh, went up into the building and I found two nurses there, the mama of the little girl and the aunt. They were nurses, they were both weeping. So I saw that they needed help more than the child. I know why the Lord Jesus put them all up. Out, Peter. Get up. Ah, what a day. I'm a nurse, I'm so and so. Get out with your water bottle. He put them all out. Jesus Christ is here, beloved. Oh, it's because we don't believe Him. We don't bank on His presence. We don't believe His word that He is not able to perform His mighty deed. It is true we're face to face with hell and with death. But we have no power. But He says, all power is mine in heaven and in earth. And so I talked to these sisters. They were precious souls. Talked faith to them until they dried their tears. And then, as we prayed for the child, the Lord moved. Next morning again, I asked one of the brethren to take me down there. I always like to follow those cases up. When I came there, the child was perfectly whole. Beautiful child. All their pneumonia, all the pain and all the fever was gone. Isn't Jesus wonderful? And I said, has the doctor been here? Yes, he's been here. What did he say? Well, he didn't like it. <laughs> he said, what did you do? Well, he said in his broken Swedish broke. Well, after you left and the doctor had threatened them. And wanted that child in the hospital. Now, that would have been the rational thing to do, but he's... This father said, well, after you went, we called our pastor and we had a little prayer meeting. Well, the doctor said, help sometimes. <laughs> well, it really helped this time. <laughs> oh, beloved, it helps every time. Let us not be discouraged when we have defeats. We don't understand all these things, but I always say I've got nothing to do with that. My business is like Abraham, to see the promise, to keep my eyes on the captain, to see the Lord. And I don't dare look at anything else, or I'll be defeated. And these are lessons we have to learn, and we ought to learn. We must learn. Faith is the victory, and faith cometh by hearing the word of God. Thus saith the Lord, and beloved, we play with it, and we trifle with it, and we fool with it, instead of saying, Thy kingdom come. Why, it means that I open my heart to Jesus Christ, and when Jesus is here, I have no business to doubt. I've got nothing to do with the victory. Here's the victory. He is here for that purpose. Praise God. I leave it to Him if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. Beloved, that's more than a promise. It's absolutely more than a promise. That's the guarantee of Almighty God that he will fulfill his word. He cannot help himself. He remains faithful. And then something happened. This child was healed. But in the afternoon, the father called our home and he said, he, you could feel in his voice, Brother Gardner answered, that he was full of unbelief. He said, she's sick again. Fever's up 204 and a half or three quarters or something. You know, they got these thermometers. They lie too. One brother said, oh, 
The fever dropped overnight from 185 to 135. <laughs> but anyway, Brother Gardner knew what to say. He said, Brother, it's your unbelief. You know that Jesus healed that child. Now you leave it to Christ and you claim that healing. And as he talked faith to him, faith rose in his heart. And he hadn't hung up the telephone when that child was perfectly delivered, perfectly free. Now I'm sure the child could have had that sickness again and could have died. Don't have to. Beloved, it's his proposition, not mine. It isn't I. I didn't tell Jesus to bear my sicknesses. The Father told him to. <laughs> the Father swore by himself that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. And so we have a double surety. We have Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our transgressions, and who was raised again for our justification. Beloved, we have a living Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ooh, I thought today, my, what a, what a miracle God has wrought for us. Almost everybody praises God in new tongues. Do you know what a miracle that is? Why, the Holy Ghost has come. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God himself that dwells in your body. And what does he dwell there for? Well, what did he come to Nazareth for? What did he come to do? He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. And what has the Spirit of God come to do within your body? But to bring deliverance to you. To bring victory to you, thank God. And what is he waiting for? You don't... Brother Bosworth always says, you don't have to pray for healing. You don't. It's already offered. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you. Try believing him instead of believing. I always say people bring their doctor books. They're, they're very nice, aren't they? They'll tell you all about your ailment. Many years ago, before I came here, I read in, in one one time, and really, I had only read about a page when I got so sick. I did. But listen, we have a doctor book that, that reads you up to, <laughs> tells you the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I know that Jesus Christ is here. Jesus, I know you're here tonight. And I know you're just as eager tonight to heal all that are sick as you were in those days when you looked upon the multitude like sheep without a shepherd. But now we have a shepherd <laughs> whom God brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will make you perfect in every good work to do his will. What does he mean when he says, pray, thy kingdom come? Why, that's the destruction of the kingdom of the devil. And it's my business to declare that Jesus Christ is alive. And when I declare it with my mouth and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, things will happen. Jesus will reign. <laughs> He'll take his great power and he will reign within you. Praise the Lord. I know that we're standing before a great day, a wonderful day. All the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And the devil's going to be put in the pit. But how will it happen? Jesus is the only one that can do it. But he wants you and me to be vessels, to be channels. You and me to be among those who who take up the fight honestly. We cannot do it with natural weapons. We need to have the weapons that are mighty through God. The word of faith is in your mouth and is in your heart. And what does he mean by that? He means that's Christ. Christ is that word of faith. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. What a wonderful word. 
That ought to create faith in our hearts because that blood was shed for me. As quilt for me, is teure blood. As macht auch meinen Schaden gut. Then Christus starb for me. How many in this meeting have had a wonderful experience of healing? I just looked at Mariechen Klum, how God brought her into Pentecost by healing her of ulcers. One woman said to me, I got ulcers. Well, that's a bad sickness. <laughs> but she got, didn't you get healed of that? <laughs> sure, long ago. And everyone here has experienced Christ, praise God. But beloved, God has much more for us. Thank God. None of us live to ourselves. None of us die to ourselves. Why are you afraid to die? The Lord is Lord, both of the dead and of the living. But if I live unto him, glory to God, he'll take care of my living. And when I die unto him, he'll take care of my dying. And it'll be glory all along the way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so really the Lord has surprised me many times. <laughs> many times. Last Sunday again we asked to testify to the healing of that little boy after the meeting. Sister I told me, you know he was healed right after you prayed. Had a ruptured eardrum. Not only God could do that, but God does it. And beloved, God's here tonight to heal all that are sick. Do you know how eagerly Jesus Christ wants to do that? How he desires it. But he says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Oh, let us have the faith of God. Come, let us rouse our hearts tonight to love him. After all, divine healing is a love affair. Jesus Christ, who bore my afflictions. How much more shall your heavenly Father? And you know what defeats us? It's this woe begone expression. How many, many times I've met it. Hard to get through praying for a person. And praying the prayer of faith. And somebody that's prayed with me says, Oh, can't keep anything on his stomach. He vomits it all up again. Paid no attention to the prayer. No attention to Jesus. No faith. Nothing at all. Oh, if you ask them, sure, they've got big swelling words of faith. But there's nothing behind it. But beloved, when the heart believes that God has raised him from the dead, Jesus Christ is on the throne. He takes over. Hallelujah. And do you know how Jesus Christ desires to take over today? Do you know that there's something beyond divine healing for every one of us? The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I would be afraid if I couldn't claim Jesus Christ as the strength of my life. As my life-giving portion. And I want to learn my lesson better every day. And a lot depends on what I say with my mouth. Let me glorify Jesus Christ. And not the devil. I told you before how when in Hamburg my arm got stiff. Now I, anybody that knows anything about medical science would have called it arthritis. I never gave it a name. Don't you do it. Don't act so smart. Don't call it by any name at all. Unless you say, that's a lie of the devil. That's, all. that's what it is. It's a lie of the devil. Strange. It was very strange to me. I couldn't. I came home with it and I couldn't lift my arm. And you know, it was amusing to me. Instead of scaring me, I had a laugh at myself. I had to lift it up like this. I, I put it on the table like this. And then if I wanted to get a fork, I had to go like this, like a crawfish, and get my fork. But strange, 
never bothered me. I said, okay, Lord, I'll raise one hand. I'll praise you with one hand. It was, wasn't long before the other one was just as well as this. So that's five years ago or six years ago. Thank God. God did that. I could have had a real trial. Do you know that? Yes, you can. You can make your choice. But isn't it wonderful that we can choose Jesus? Isn't it marvelous when the elders came to Jairus and said, Don't trouble the master now. Just let him go. He's a busy man. Jairus held on to him. And Jesus immediately held on to Jairus and says, Fear not. Only believe and she shall live. What does he say to you and to me? Does Jesus ever say, well, it's, it's time to, to get anxious. It's really time to be a little bit afraid. You know, that could be very serious. It could be very serious. And people will come around, they'll tell you how serious it is. You look just like my grandmother two days before the Lord took her home. It's very helpful in your faith. Listen, let us talk Jesus. Let us talk faith. And the Bible says that we shall, because of this word, what would you say? Why the sad Phoenician woman was willing to take the place of a little dog and to lick up the crumbs. But you and I are children, beloved children of the Most High God, of whom Jesus says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to them that ask Him? How much more? Let us take an attitude of faith tonight. Let us come to Jesus Christ as a child to His Father. Why, of course He'll heal me. Why, of course. What do you think? Why, certainly He will. <laughs> like a woman who brought her child with a broken arm. I saw her come through the door and the Lord immediately impressed me that that child would be healed. And after she was prayed for, she immediately took the arm out of the sling and swung it around like this, perfectly healed. I said to the mother, now isn't that wonderful? How quickly the Lord, why she said, that's what we came for. She was a young Christian. She hadn't gotten old enough to imbibe a lot of unbelief. Why, she came for that purpose. And if you come for that purpose, you'll find out that God means exactly what he says, not something else. Praise the Lord. It says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Not a long wash of unbelief with a thousand question marks. But the prayer of faith shall, I like that word, shall. Beloved, the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus said, how should the scripture be fulfilled if I don't act upon it? But I know we can't act unless faith is alive. And that's what we come together for. To hear the word of God. And as we look at the promise, faith is bound to spring up within your heart. And faith is victory. Oh, faith. O oh, Glaube, seliges Geheimnis. Viel besser muss ich dich verstehen, als Gottes Wort die Welt geschaffen, da sprach er nur, so war es geschehen. And God spoke one word, and that word is his son, and that son became a sacrifice for you and for me. Thank God. I'm so glad that he not only bore my sins, but listen, he actually bore my sickness too. He did. He did. Glory to God. He did, and yours too. Praise the Lord. And if you don't get healed right away, don't talk unbelief. Don't get scared. But hang on like the side of Phoenicia. <laughs> oh, that we might learn this one lesson to hang on in faith. But, beloved, there's more than divine healing. Really? There's more involved. It's a question of whether Jesus Christ shall reign and gain the victory or whether the devil shall continue his dirty work. That's why I like to pray for the sick and, and I want to see them get healed because everyone that gets healed is a healing for me. 
And everyone that's defeated is a defeat for me. I bear sorrow in my heart over some that have been defeated because it's been a defeat for the whole church, the whole kingdom of God. But what a victory. Think of Brother Bosworth when he was 25 years old, dying with consumption. And he says that a little Methodist woman has kept him out of heaven all these years now. But look how many thousands are going to heaven because he didn't die. He went and preached the gospel. Now he could have died and they could have said at his grave, well, we don't understand God's ways, but God never makes a mistake. And what's then all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. You could say all that stuff, you know, and not mean it. I'm so glad that God made his will so definitely known. You don't, you don't have to question. Brother Bosworth <laughs> has been used of God to bring the light of divine healing and he's stuck to his guns and God only knows what he told me personally that he, he was used of God to start a hundred revivals. He came to Joliet, city in Illinois. And God had sent him there, him and his wife, and he opened a tent meeting. And after two months, mind you, after two months, it was such a hard, stony place. The word somehow didn't go in. And he said to his wife, I'm going to quit. He says, nothing happens here. She says, no, you don't dare. We spent $2,000 now. And now we're not going to run away. Now, God bless the women. <laughs> I tell you, they have sometimes more grit than we men. I found that out. God bless them. He knew what, what he meant when he said, I'll make him and help. <laughs> and so she said, no, we're going to stick it out now. And so they did. And then God moved. A wonderful way. A man was brought into the tent, dying. He was a painter. And he had fallen from the ladder and broken his back. And the result was that from the hip down, he was dead. Gangrene had set in. And uh, he wasn't saved either. But he had heard about this place. And they carried him into the tent. My brother Bosworth explained it to me. He said that his skin had become black. You know how that looks, gangrene. And there was nothing but bones and skin and pus. Everything had rotted. They brought him into the tent. <laughs> There was that night, the Salvation Army Lassie was there for the first time. And she saw that. She says, terrible to bring a man like that into the tent. But Brother Boswell prayed for him. And they carried him out. And after two weeks, this Salvation Army Lassie said, I must go to that tent and find out what happened to that man. She thought, of course, he was dead. And as she came into the tent, that fellow stood on the platform with his bare feet and he was showing his toes and wriggling them and showing the people how the Lord had healed him. <laughs> I tell you the revival was on. <laughs> and isn't it too bad that God's got to take sinners to show forth his glory and we saints, we defeat him all the time. Oh, if we were willing to die for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, God would show his miracles and his wonders. But never mind. Let us eat this word. You know that man liveth not by bread alone or by cornflakes. But by every word that proceedeth. Oh, I love the words of God. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Think of it. I am called by thy name. Not a dog that grovels under the table of his master and licks up the crumbs. I am called by thy name, Lord God of hosts. Oh, how I ought to eat this bread of life that comes down from heaven. And it would be hell to all the flesh 
and you'll find out that divine healing is not something to trifle with. God says, I am your life. And I am the length of your days. And you'll presently find out that another man lives inside of you. It's Jesus Christ himself. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the gift of Almighty God to every one of us. Bread. It's bread of life. He says, if you don't eat this bread, you'll die. But he that eats me shall live by me. And that's the privilege that we have. But it's more than a privilege. It's a command of God. You know that he commands you to live. I said to Sister Rosenthal, she was 80 years old and she got sick. And the doctor had come and examined her and he said, only an operation can save you from a horrible, torturous death. And so she said, I want to go home. I said, don't you dare. You can always die, but you can't always live and, and witness for Jesus. <laughs> and she did live and she was healed. Praise the Lord. She was made well by the power of God. God commands you and me to present our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I know we're in, in the kindergarten stage of our experience. I know that. I know God does not expect of us more than we're ready for. But maybe we would be ready for a great deal more if we had listened more carefully. And if we had been more careful to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And confess that God raised him from the dead with our hearts. We're so quick to confess something else. So quick. <laughs> Why don't we confess that Jesus Christ has died for us and rose again and that he lives within us. Praise God and that this body is not mine at all. Why should I bother? Why should I worry about this body of mine? It's his. His body. Lost to him every member of my body. Every tissue. <laughs> every atom of my being. Every hair on my head. He cares more for it. He's numbered it. I haven't. Uh, haven't taken time. But he did. He took time to find out. Well, I know approximately 65,000. <laughs> but anyway, listen, folks, don't you think we ought to wake up? Don't you think we ought to wake, awake up to the wonder of Jesus? And how are we going to wake up if every time the devil fires off his pop gun, we run for the next rat hole? <laughs> the Bible says resist the devil. You can make him run. Do you know that? Yeah, but get your tea bag now and wrap it up. That tea is all right. It's better than coffee. <laughs> You know, we have, a, we have a wonderful witness in Elder Brooks. That man was 45 years old. Thought he was dying. Ulcers, hemorrhoids. And you've read in his life story. The awful, awful condition. And when he came to Dr. Dowie, Dr. Dowie bawled him out publicly. He says, you talk about your saloon keepers driving the people to hell. It's you preachers that do that. And Elder got good and hot under the collar. He lost all the sanctification he ever dreamed of. <laughs> but he had come all the way from somewhere south to hear Dr. Down. So he thought, well, I'll stay a few days. And then he woke up when he heard that man preach faith three times a day. Three hour length, long sermon. <laughs> And he had to sit there and take it. <laughs> and so then he wanted Dr. Dowie to pray for him. Dr. Dowie said, nothing doing. You get rid of your medicine. <laughs> what? I can't live with. I can't eat. If I don't take a pill before eating, I suffer agonies of hell. Well, I won't pray for you, Dr. Dowie says. That's not the prayer of faith. 
You can't serve two masters. So when he got rid of that medicine, he got healed. He said 15 minutes afterwards, he was healed and never had his trouble again. But anyway, he lived until he was 98 years old, and we have known him intimately and personally. One time he suffered from kidney stones, had a terrific pain. Awful pain, and so the saints, of course, prayed. He was in Zion then already, and they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally, the Lord gave him a word and said, You get up, it was dinner time, go downstairs and eat a good meal. Why, well, said he thought it'd kill him to get up with that pain. But he obeyed God. He resisted the devil. He got up in that pain, dressed himself. And he said it was agony. But every step he took, that agony ceased. And by the time he got down to the table, he was perfectly healed and had a ravenous appetite. He was healed by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Beloved, you don't need to wait for a message like that. You've got it in the Bible. It's there. You don't have to wait for Brother Brenham to tell you you're healed. The Bible says you're healed. It says by his stripes you're healed. Praise the Lord. And another time, he had ulcers of the stomach, or ulcers, or whatever you call them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he couldn't eat anymore. Especially fat. He couldn't eat fat. Jack Sprack could eat no fat. His wife could eat no lean. Well, he couldn't eat fat. And you know what the Lord did? <laughs> Strange. When they wanted water in the wilderness, the Lord sent Moses to a rock. He says, you talk to the rock and he'll give water. If he had said, make a hole in the ground and the water will come up, that would have been easier to believe, wouldn't it? But God says, you go to that rock. And it was flint. And talk to the rock. Oh, I tell you, I have a wonderful God. Do you know him? Do you love him? Is he your father? Do you have a father? Or are you poor or... Listen, do you have a father? <laughs> who has begotten you again unto a living hope? Who has so loved you that he gave his only begotten son and spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. Oh, ye of little faith. And Elder Brooks was told by the Lord, or his wife, to cook him an eight-course meal now. And the Lord said, I'm going to tell her just what to cook and what to put on, on the t table. <laughs> Poor wife. But she was obedient to God. And she went and she cooked. I don't know what it was, except that there was a big lump of butter. And Elder Brooks, he couldn't look at that butter. So he was obedient with his stomach rolling, you know, and bellowing and, <laughs> and, and hurting like a, <laughs> He ate that meal. And he was as sick as before until uh, Mr. Mitchell came. And you know, Mr. Mitchell had a terrific voice when he spoke by the Lord. If he would just, just say, and a shooty, it would make people's hair stand up straight. <laughs> There's something in his voice that would scare a German police dog. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Elder, you didn't do what the Lord told you to do. Yes, I did, Elder. Why? No, you didn't. The Lord told you to eat everything your wife put before you. And there's that butter. Half a pound of butter, or evangelistically speaking. <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> Poor Elder Brooks had to take a spoon and eat that butter. And as soon as he had swallowed it, his pain was gone, his sickness was gone. He was healed, praise the Lord. Listen, it takes something to be healed by the Lord. It takes Jesus Christ. And it takes obedience to him and faith in him. But who in the world wouldn't believe Jesus Christ when he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee? Who would doubt him? Well, we all do, don't we? 
Season to talk healing. Now I feel good. <laughs> but to say, get thee behind me seated when that seven-headed monster rises with ten horns. And a tail like woman's hair and teeth. <laughs> <laughs> they overcame him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Faith is the victory tonight. This very moment, faith is the victory. Oh, let us believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and leave everything to him. Glory to God. Beloved, it's his command. It's his will. It's his kingdom. It's his glory. What difference does it make whether I live or die? There are plenty others. But oh, it does make a lot of difference whether I make room for Jesus Christ to manifest his glory. Didn't I say to you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? And the trouble is when we get into real trouble, we have amassed a pile of unbelief that chokes us. Chokes the word. It doesn't bring forth fruit. Listen, God will hold us responsible for this meeting tonight. You know that? He is sowing the seed, giving his word. Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And when we are made acquainted with the word of God, we ought to deal with God over his word. And that's what we've been doing these weeks. And people have testified how light is coming to them. Do you know where that light comes from? Do you know why a light comes into your soul? Oh, Jesus. Why, of course. Why didn't I see this before? Why, that's God that does it. Your Father is creating faith in your soul. Now, when the test comes, give that light of the Holy Ghost a chance. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Confess that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead.